Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Zakowski, and I, um, I appreciate having the opportunity to come and share with you some of our data and some of our findings um, on the leukodystrophies. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, one example where we, um, we went into a study with a particular goal, and we, we found a very different answer. And then another example where we were, we're sort of trying to progress more into better understanding progression in ALD, and where I think we're getting closer, actually, so it's a more positive response. But I feel like showing both of those contrasting views is important because that's a really common problem in, um, in lots of diseases and lots of studies. So ALD is a X-linked disorder. Um, its incidence is really similar to PKU, about 1 in 17,000. It's pan-ethnic in distribution. Um, it's uh, caused by um, a problem encoding um, a gene um, on the ABCD1, the peroxisomal ATPase binding cassette protein, that causes a defect in peroxisomal beta oxidation with also an accumulation of very long chain fatty acids. It affects um, many systems, but predominantly myelin, um, adrenal cortex, and lytic cells of the testes. Um, the classic views of ALD is that there's a cerebral form, which is about 35% of individuals. It, this form is much more uh, diffuse, um, inflammatory, and it's very rapidly progressing. And I'm showing here an example of a, um, a boy um, who ha was diagnosed with cerebral form, and one year later is very, very different. So it's very quickly progressing, and as um, onset is somewhere between four and eight years. Um, another form is the, is the adult subtype, the adrenal myelineuropathy, which affects um, 40 to 45 percent of individuals. Um, it's more of a distal axonopathy that's mainly in the spinal cord, and I'll come back to that as a really nice model for how we're using some imaging techniques. Um, it affects young adults, um, although um, there's no, initially no cerebral disease. In 20 to 40 percent of individuals, they will progress to having cerebral disease. And um, in 20 to 30 percent of individuals will have Addison's disease that mostly will develop into AMN later. Uh, some uh, carriers are asymptomatic, but more than 50 percent of them will develop AMN in adult years, and we're also progressing further in trying to understand the differences between men and women with this disease. So the role of very long chain fatty acids seems really critical to this, and how is it, how is it um, affected with the pathogenesis? So it's very unclear. Is it, affecting, is it affecting the stability of axons or myelin membranes? Is there a role in, or a trigger for an immune response? This is kind of how the kind of questions we were coming at it with. So, so back in 1989, Rizzo designed a study thinking, well, maybe the important thing is to decrease very long chain fatty acids. So he uh, designed Lorenzo's oil, which is a four to one composition of oleic to erucic acid. And, and he took 12 newly diagnosed um, children and treated them for 2 to 19 months and found that within 4 to 8 weeks, the um, very long chain fatty acids decreased um, and went back, to, back down to normal levels. However, they still showed clinical deterioration. So this is my example where we thought this would be a really great idea to decrease very long chain fatty acids and it didn't really um, affect the clinical outlook. So the issues were the Lorenzo's oil did what, it, what, what we thought we wanted it to do, but the clinical response was not very encouraging. So then the thought was, well, maybe it just requires longer. Maybe the myelin composition isn't really changing. Maybe the very long chain, maybe the Lorenzo's oil isn't really getting into the brain. Um, so then individuals thought, well, maybe let's try some of this in AMN. So there are multiple studies where um, there is no very clear, definitive answer. And this is common with rare diseases. There's a, a smaller sample of people. So this causes a problem. Are we really getting to the true answer? Um, do we have the, the right kind of markers to detect a change? Um, many of these studies um, used individuals with varying phenotypes, different ages, men versus women, when we really don't know if they're, what the big differences are between um, genders. So, and, and all of the studies were uncontrolled, so no definitive answer. Um, however, in spite of all those limits, um, pre pretty predominantly the scientific community thought, well, Lorenzo's oil doesn't work. Um, so Hugo Moser went in with the idea, well, maybe let's try decreasing very long chain fatty acids on children who don't have, who don't have symptoms yet. So um, he published a study where he showed that it does change the outlook. 
So children who don't have symptoms will have symptoms later. It doesn't stop the symptoms from occurring, but it makes it occur later. So it's a step in the right direction, but certainly not the, the answer we were really looking for. So the, there are issues in studying AMN. So there's disease burden at presentation. It's nice um, from, a, um, from a scientific model because the disease is more slowly progressing. Um, it occurs more over decades. But there's still limited markers. That's been talked about all morning. So um, there, there's MRI, but predominantly people have used more rating scales. There are clinical rating scales um, to try to descri describe the general clinical outlook. Those are also very uh, muddy and not very clear. And there's some electrophysiological studies. So that's how we started this. What kind of markers would we really want to use? Um, so at Kennedy Krieger, they started a study where um, they tried using preventative therapy in AMN and carriers. So it was a placebo-controlled study um, using Lorenzo's oil or a placebo. The planned enrollment was 120 men with AMN and 120 symptomatic carriers. And it would be four years in duration, and every subject would get yearly a series of exams, a neuro exam. We would do MRI of the brain and cervical spinal cord. Um, they would get a nutrition evaluation and counseling. And they would get this quantitative motion analysis is more trying to get at um, quantifying symptoms, strength, sensation, walking, that kind of thing. Um, and the outcome measures that were chosen were the, the, the industry standard, right? The EDSS, um, quantitative clinical rating scales. Um, and then we also in, um, started to um, develop more quantitative functional measures using MRI. However, there were problems um, that led to having to have a premature termination of the study. So what we've done to this point is use the data we had to develop some of these outcome measures. So we really um, have evaluated um, the neuroimaging of the spine in AMN. So AMN is a really nice model. It's very unique in the sense that um, the two tracts that die back are the dorsal column medial lumniscal tract and the cortical spinal tract. And, and pathologically, it's been found that the tracts die away from their distal ends forward. So that's nice if we could capture tract specific information using MRI. And Andrea Grotman gave a really nice introduction of diffusion tensor imaging, which is one of the techniques that we use. Because we wanted it to be sensitive to tissue microstructure, but more importantly, for this disease, specific tracts. Um, so we use a three Tesla magnet, um, and we collected 16 slices from C1 to C3. And everyone says, well, why didn't we do the whole spinal cord? It's very difficult to actually capture information through the whole spinal cord. It's a very small organ, and there's lots of um, muscle and lungs and heart that are in the way that really cause um, distortion. So it's very hard to get um, the kind of resolution that we need to do diffusion tensor imaging lower in the cord. So this is pretty much the industry standard that, that we can acquire. Um, we calculated, we used diff diffusion tensor imaging and calculated four different measures. So fractional anisotropy um, gives us some information. The mean diffusivity gives us different information. Lambda parallel and lambda perpendicular all give us unique information about the infrastructure of um, the, the, the tissues. So I can't say that it's giving us fiber-specific information, but it's giving us information about that water molecule and where it's traveling um, along the fibers. And I will tell you that the latest evidence has really been in support of using lambda parallel and lambda perpendicular to give us more specific information about axons and myelin, which is important in AMN because we think it's a, um, a, a myelin loss that's causing the problem. So from a clinical perspective, um, I'll show you, we, I just, I, as I mentioned before, we used the EDSS, um, and we focused um, on a smaller group who only had scores between 1 and 6.5. We wanted them to be able to walk, even with a device. Um, and we used a series of functional measures, some of them measured by a stopwatch, and some of them measured with, with uh, higher technology. So for example, balance, we have a force plate um, that will allow us to quantify how much someone moves statically, or if we ask them to move, exactly how much are they moving, which has been shown to be um, important for measuring um, falls and more practical functional measure. And we related some of these, um, some of our DTI measures, and I'm just showing two actually um, here, with these functional measures. So the get up and go test, 
is a, clinical, a common clinical test where you ask someone to stand up from a chair, walk three meters, turn around and come back and sit in the chair, and you time it. And the idea is this is going to give us an idea of how quick, how functional you are with walking and, and, um, and ambulation. Our balance measure, again, is this measure we use on a force plate. How much do you move when we ask you to stand still? Um, and we found pretty good correlation with our DTI measures and some of these functional measures. And there was variability, as you would imagine. We also used a diff different technique called magnetization transfer imaging. So this is a technique that allows us to capture and quantify macro structure. So macromolecular structure. So the idea is can we capture and quantify myelin changes more specifically than what we get with DTI? So magnetization transfer allows us to not only visualize, so this is the spinal cord, you can see sort of the um, characteristic butterfly gray matter um, pattern. And the idea with MT, which is what I'll call it from here on out, is that you can, you can differentiate visually gray versus white matter, which is nice. You can see here that this person has a lesion in their dorsal column compared to what you should see here. And more importantly, in our study, we found that using MT um, in the cervical spinal cord, we could differentiate controls from women who have AMN from the men who have AMN. So it's clearly sensitive enough to detect even more subtle changes, which is an important characteristic. Um, from a more longitudinal perspective, what I'm showing here is the change in MT value over time, and this is at um, 12 months, and then the second is at 24 months. The red curve are people that are on a placebo, so not on the Lorenzo's oil, and an increase means there's, um, there's, there's worsening of the MT score. Um, the blue, these are people who were compliant with the Lorenzo's oil over 12 months and 24 months. A decrease in MT um, is a reflective of normalization or less abnormality in the MT. And you can see over 12 months there's a dramatic change and then over 20, 12 more months, which is up to 24 months, it goes up some but doesn't go back to baseline. And this is something we're trying to investigate now. So what I've shown you, what I'm, what I, what I think our group is really trying to work towards is we thought initially very long chain fatty acids might be the ticket. This might be what really causes the clinical change and it didn't turn out to be the, the story. So now maybe we can use more advanced neuroimaging to get at the track specific behavior that is present in this disease and give us a better indication of progression and allow us to have a, a faster way to test whether medications or other pharmacologic agents may benefit people. Um, so I've shown you information showing that some of our DTI metrics um, were, showed strong correlations in men, stronger in men than women. Um, MT weighted imaging um, correlated as well, um, both uh, cross-sectionally and longitudinally with the reduction in plasma very long chain fatty acids. And this gives us the ability to probe this structure function relationship, which I think is really critical to not forget the clinical output side is, is important, but trying to relate it back to the pathology. And I think MRI, at least the more um, advanced um, types of MRI really give us the opportunity to do that. Though I recognize, and I think it's important to mention that this isn't available everywhere. This kind of imaging is not um, the clinical standard. And so the idea would be to better understand it in a study and then be able to figure out what kinds of imaging we really need, not only for diagnostic purposes, but to determine change.